the basic thing I'm going to do and the argument that I'm going to try to make is I think we're in the midst of a revolution of thinking. You know, risk is, I've been around the risk field for almost since it started, so I've been there for some time. And, and I'll try to say a little something about, uh, you know, what I think that does well and what it doesn't do so well. And I think resilience and sustainability have come to the fore. I mean, we heard that there are 1.2 million references uh, to resilience and there's a lot to sustainability. I think there are some reasons for that. Risk is inherently a negative term and resilience and sustainability are inherently more positive terms and people like them better. And, and uh, so I think they're enjoying much uh, broader uh, use. And uh, so I'm going to try to make the argument that uh, I think we're in the midst of a certain kind of revolution uh, and that will require sorting out uh, where risk ought to be applied and where we could use it well. And um, what role does resilience play in, in all of this? And um, I'll end up at one point a number of years ago I got contacted by Swiss Ray uh, in, in Europe and they said, you know, Roger, we don't know what's going on with risk and resilience and can you tell us how those things might be interrelated? And I took a crack at it and I'm sure you can improve it, uh, what, what I, I said. And uh, so if we, could, if we could spend a little time on that, that would be really good. All right, so just a, a word in the way of introduction. Um, I'd like to say a little bit about uh, the work of, in a way, the work of this, the intellectual domain that this institute is in, uh, which really looks at global environmental change. And I want to try to make some distinctions between what I think risk assessment does and what resilience and sustainability do. And I think as there is more and more tendency to move into sustainability science. There are some implications for that. And I think we ought to try to talk about that somewhat if we could. And I'll try to make some distinctions of what I think the differences are between these two things. And uh, we've heard a little bit about vulnerability today. I think vulnerability is a crucial issue in all of this, whether it's sustainability or it's uh, traditional uh, risk assessment, and so that'll be a topic that we'll uh, come to. And then I'll, I'll try to say both something about, uh, so let's try to think about sustainability. If we're on the verge of, of that, what would that mean? How does it change the kind of work that we normally do? And, uh, and then finish up with, there are a number of really very basic challenges, and we have a tendency to jump into things without really sorting through all the challenges. And if we got time, we could talk about risk communication. That I think is a great example of how you jump into things, but you don't get it straight. And uh, so I think there are a lot of problems with what we do in the area of risk communication. OK. First, just to say, just to present a simple model of when we talk about risk assessment, I think we're talking about something like this. We're talking about natural variability and human driving forces that are going. They change the environment uh, in a number of different ways, posing threats of various kinds in many cases. And, you know, on the upper right hand, socioeconomic vulnerability, 10 years ago, that wasn't there. Uh, it's kind of interesting that in the risk assessment field, it's only really within about the last 10 or 15 years that we've started to really look in a detailed way at vulnerability. And we found out, I think, that you can have relatively minor events, but if you have very high vulnerability, you may get big impacts over here and, you know, vice versa. So it's important to try to, and ecosystems fragility has some of the same kind of role. So it's really, it's great to talk about exposure and to do the classic kind of hazard uh, thing to look at exposure, dose response, and then consequences and so forth. But we really need to look at vulnerability and ecosystem fragility in the, in the process 
and look at how the events interact with them to produce impacts. Okay? Um, let me start by saying something about what I think the differences between these two approaches are. So traditional science, if you will, traditional risk assessment, I think in many cases has been curiosity driven. Some of it has been practitioner, you know, management of, of problems, but at least in the field and the writing of the field and, and so forth, there's been a lot of tendency to do what science does, to uh, view science as a place that has expertise, it's where we really learn about uh, risks and so forth. And sustainability science is really quite different. You start off saying, what kinds of problems are we really dealing with and what's important? So let's not just advance the field of science. Let's really try to solve some problems out there. And um, traditional science has tended to be uh, although it's never really achieved it, but it's uh, tried to be relatively value-free in the way that science has, has operated. And sustainability science is value-centered, and that's really very different. I mean, um, it's necessary, I think, to really be specific about. It's interesting about the conversation we've had in Europe about this, that uh, some of the Europeans sort of look and say, Raj, you don't come and talk to us about, you know, we know all the American work is, is all uh, positivist kind of thing. They're really not interested in end states and outcomes and goals and social goals and ethics and that kind of thing. And I say, that's not the field, that's not the uh, field that I know and so forth. But sustainability science makes it even clearer and, but also poses a problem for us of, uh, you know, we need to have the values up front there. They need to be very clear. And the outcomes that we're working uh, for uh, can't just sort of come, uh, come along and you try to reduce some of the risk to people. Sustainability science needs to be uh, very clear about the specific goals that uh, we're seeking to achieve. Um, traditional science has tended to be divide and conquer break things up and try to analyze them and come up. Holistic sustainability science by its, its uh, the makeup of it has tended to be holistic in the way that it tries to. And being holistic is, I mean, it's fine to wave your hand and say that. It's very difficult to think about how to be more, it's a lot easier to divide problems up and try to deal with individual problems. Being holistic about how you're moving to those broad social goals and how the whole set of inter interactions and changes are related to that is a lot more, a lot more uh, difficult. We had a little conversation about expertise. We'll probably talk more about that. Um, uh, you know, uh, some, of the, some of the environmental psychologists who have worked in the field say the scientists are the worst at really being expert, they sometimes have an extremely narrow approach to something that's inherently a broad set of issues. And so let's really talk about expertise, and expertise for what? For what kinds of risks and so forth? And one of the things is, you know, sustainability science really looks at the uh, at risk as being risk. Um, years ago, we defined risk as as um, hazards or, or uh, harm to potential harm uh, to people and their values. And so the values of people, uh, we're experiencing this in Denmark at the moment, uh, often relate to the community and how you're changing the community. And it may be all the trucks and so forth that are coming through the community that change it, or it may be that people oh, I wanted to go to a place that really didn't involve the industrialization of the ocean. I don't like that uh, wind energy that you're proposing to put there. That's a risk that I'm really concerned about. And that doesn't make it onto the traditional notions of risk, uh, which were dominated by, some of you may know, by what was, um, what was called five, <laughs> five minutes. Only five minutes left. Okay, I better get on. 
Um, well, maybe I'll do this with the five remaining minutes that I have. So um, while there's a lot of uh, pressure and movement in that direction, and you can see that by, uh, I was quite amazed to hear that there are 1.2 million uh, pieces that have uh, resilience or sustainability in the title. But in any event, uh, how we can really achieve the integrated analysis that we're talking about, that it's not just the deficit model anymore, people. It's not just the physical harm that's happening to individual people. It's disruption of the community. It's effects on the institutions. It's, you know, civil liberties, damage to civil liberties. It's all kinds of, of things. And we need a, a rich enough value, a rich enough array of, of risks and hazards to really deal with, and it's some of why we're getting this push to sustainability. Uh, in the end, we need to talk about alternative uh, regional futures for um, we're trying to deal with risk assessment and sustainability in a particular area, but that always has implications for developmental paths or future uh, regional, uh, alternative regional futures and so forth. So we need to be explicit about that, and maybe that involves uh, scenario building as well as other kinds of, of innovative uh, methodologies that, that are used. Um, we're beginning the whole process of how you bridge uh, science and, and policy. Uh, we're now beginning to get some papers on public engagement and both in the risk field and in sustainability science field, but particularly in the sustainability science field, I think the question of how we get engagement, how you talk with publics, how they talk back, and how you listen to publics, and uh, what do you do with, with the whole array of different stakeholders who need to be involved in the process? What does the process look like? So when ran that Stuttgart University, you know, was starting to, to write work on governance systems related to risk. Well, that's not in the traditional area of, of uh, risk. It is moving forward in some directions we've not gone before. And uh, okay, and then I'll finish up. So we have deve alternative developmental pathways uh, in both developed and but particularly in developing societies and dealing with the most, uh, I don't see it there, but dealing with the most vulnerable uh, people is a crucial part of, of that, or as we no longer have many of them, but Marxist analysis in the area would talk to us about uh, uh, the class structure that goes on and how that's related to vulnerability. What are the long-term trends uh, that are creating higher vulnerability and so forth. And then we've heard quite a bit already about adaptive management, that that's becoming more and more crucial, obviously, and resilience and sustainability work. And we're just beginning, really, to try to really think out. Uh, adaptation is at the core of that. And um, some kinds of adaptations occur, but not others. And um, how do we encourage societies? We had discussion about that this morning, about some of the different adaptation uh, scenarios, if you will, or approaches. Uh, that we need to talk about, and maybe I'll stop. Okay? Please. Yeah, can I just, just, just pick up a, a, a sort of language issue which may be relevant, because we're here talking over this week around the differences uh, or similarities or whatever between risk <laughs> and resilience. But equally, you've used the words sustainability and resilience and almost synonymously. And I think there's a growing body of work which is saying, well, actually, or questioning the differences between those, those terms. Um, they, are, they are similar in many ways, not least because they get appropriated by all different types of policy communities, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah. fundamentally, the question is, is there a difference between the two? Yeah. Um, I would argue that there is. Others would argue that there isn't, and we could use some so, of so, so can you expand on that so, at all? Well, I, I, would say I think it's a great criticism. Yeah, it's, not and a criticism. It's, a, it's a question. Um, I would see sustainability as equilibrialist. It, 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 sustainability, etymologically, is about stability returning back 
whereas resilience is about moving forward. So it's almost related to the point yeah. we were having this morning. I mean, not everybody would agree with you, but anyway. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. we're going to go there. Anybody else want to weigh yeah, in on that? So, uh, do you think that risk assessment is like science and uh, resilience and sustainability is science? So, no, um, I, I've tried to say about risk analysis that my own view of, of risk analysis is that the social sciences are critical to understanding, and that's where the expertise is in some cases, that uh, inherently, most of the risks that we're talking about involve people and people's institutions and so forth. And we need to try to understand them and evaluate them and, and so forth. So, you know, I see that as a crucial part of, and I'm very critical, uh, sometimes people don't like hearing it, about the so-called deficit model. Uh, we do the, the sort of medical sciences and physical science and we're done with risk assessment. And in some cases, I think you've missed all the big risks. So if, when are you going to deal with them? So if we want to play with the previous comment, mm. uh, looking at what people say who lead with sustainability yeah. and then bring resilience, use, then se secondarily use the resilience word, versus people who lead with resilience, at least in what started as resilience engineering from a safety perspective, there's two paradigms. Right, so if you look at sustainability, they see resilience as an ingredient to produce sustainability. Yeah. It's often in the list of ingredients that they would look for in various ways. Absolutely. Right? And if you look at what we did in resilience engineering, we started with fundamental trade-offs. So in that approach, uh, breakdowns in sustainability represent <coughs> a, sis a symptom of an inability to manage trade-offs under pressure that there are fundamental trade-offs. And when you don't manage those trade-offs well, a, sim a symptom of that will be a breakdown in, for whatever domain we're dealing with, in terms of the ability to sustain or to, re to, uh, to deal with chronic goals. And sustainability, safety, uh, equity, um, uh, economic, long-term economic viability, all of these are chronic goals. Right? And so if you look at the original stuff we were doing back in the early 00s, either, and this was in parallel from control perspectives in biology and uh, physical systems from Doyle, or what I was doing based on safety, we started with the ability to manage these fundamental trade-offs. And when you can't manage them, then you see these breakdowns and chronic goals like sustainability. So it's an inverse relationship in these two paradigms. And that's not to say I, which one is better or more productive or more viable. Just simply to note that those are two fundamentally different yeah. ways they sound compatible we do it. To me. What? They sound compatible to me. They could be, okay. but th this is a comment having interacted a lot with people like Tom and going, wait a minute, we're talking past each other often, thinking we're communicating, and that's where we came up with this. Here's two different relationships that have been in the background. Josie, we need you. Yeah, I, I, I have a CSI problem here. Because when I'm going to, I see the CSI and TV. Crime scenes investigation. CSI, you know? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Could you start off? <laughs> yeah. And they always say, I am a scientist. And that's a big problem for me. And uh, it's connected with the presentation. Because if you read resilience from the invest research point of view, resilience can be positive, can be negative, adaptation can be positive, can be negative, transformation can be bad, can be good, True. then by itself is the discretion of a process. We are talking about scientific process. Yeah. Then I agree with you that science is always connected with values, totally. But if we can, we can draw, draw a lot. I was politician, but when I am researcher, I'm not a politician, although yeah. I draw the two things. When I'm in the community, I'm a technology in applying science. Then what I have here, and a big discussion about this stuff is, okay, there are three things in my mind. All of them connected with values in society, but one more than others. Okay, we are equal, but some are more equal than others. Yeah. Science is, well, we discuss the process of resilience, we discuss, we are not preoccupied if resilience is in itself positive or negative because we are describing the, the ecosystems or the engineer systems or the, the people systems, the transformality and so on. And then 
we have the technology. Risk assessment for me and resilience in this way is a technology. That means we have instruments based on science, but they are not properly science because they are a deduction from science. Hmm. You understand what I mean? No. Uh, it's a deduction from the rules that we take from science. When we are applying uh, resilience, we use sometimes that as a metaphor. It's not a, a lot. Sometimes we have a, that problem to overcome because it's a metaphor or not a metaphor. But it's a technology that we have to apply. And that technology is always connected with values because there is no technology without values. Yeah. And then we put sustainability... Science. Excuse me? Nor is there any science without values. Yeah, but it, of course, but the problem is not... Uh, of course, uh, it, there is no science without values, but I can work with the concept of resilience and be descriptive and explanative in taking out the values. Not, it's an exercise. No science, there is no science. Look, science is like democracy. That is, it's the worst of all systems with exceptions of all the others. That means that science is really bad system. It's connected with values. Von Leeuwenhoek, when he discovered the microscope and put spermatozoids in it, he saw the babies in the spermatozoids. He saw it. Then, because he has the values that men ch uh, make the dulled information to the women. That's a proof that science can be connected with values. Yes, but it's a basic thing. But that is far away from technology where you have to choose where is the bridge. And the, the way as you weight the bridge and the options has to be valued up front. Then there is a fundamental difference. There is not an epistemological difference because science is always valid led and invalid embedded. But actually there is a practically in a, a, you know, a, a very different uh, uh, things between the science and between the application of science. And risk is the same. You have a lot of rules that you deduct from different science, like you did uh, all these years, and I do too, that we apply principles of risks and different yeah. stuff. And sustainability. Then I agree with all of you uh, that you did. My problem is putting the three things together. Yeah. We c you understand? Yeah? Yeah. That's my point. Excuse me. <laughs> this is, you know, this is a, a really a great uh, discussion about some of the things we started on this, this morning, and we're poking them into another level now, and I'm appreciating some of these comments that are being made or, around. James, just, were you out of time? No, just maybe one, one more question. That's yeah. not, uh, again, Go ahead. however you want to, no, it's not my question. Uh, however you want to moderate this. So, uh, Roger, what is, Except for me, uh, from your point of view, what are the main differences between <laughs> risk and resilience and how we can connect them? What is your position on that? Well, you know, in that table that I outlined of, of saying what's value-centered and what's value-free and what tends to be holistic and one tends to be divide and conquer, and, uh, and I really take the point about transformations uh, of, of being, uh, I mean, if you go back to the things we talked about this morning, we were saying we want something that can really make transformations pretty quickly and easily, and, but we weren't facing the fact that maybe we've transformed them in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there were some nice points being made here, I think. Uh, One very last question. So you were at the beginning Igor, of the we're going to get you mic'd up. No more <laughs> questions. Well, it's important one. So you got at the beginning of risk assessment of the field. It seems like we are now in the beginning of resilience as the field. Are there any observation from your, uh, like, historical? How can we as a community build resilience as a new field? Uh, maybe in parallel how risk was... So I'll make just one comment, and somebody may want to fight about that, um, is I think there are some kinds of problems that we face that can be dealt with in traditional risk management and risk, particularly risk mitigation and so forth. So a large array of floods, for example, can be dealt with in that way or certain improvements in our infrastructure in urban areas can help us deal with, with uh, 
Um, but then I, I think, um, in many cases, I think, you know, it's not enough because it's fine for certain kinds of risk problems, but you get into the extreme events and the unforeseen kinds of, of uh, things, and you wish your society was, was more resilient, that the people knew something about this, that you had done emergency planning and evacuation, that there had been preparedness of various kinds, that maybe wouldn't happen if you really believed the risk mitigation was fine and could handle the problem. So there are all kinds of things about resilience that I think go beyond risk, and we need to be doing that.